you should have been you should have received an email that gave you instructions to download all of the software and things that you're going to be using in this next illustrious uh, 80 minutes. I would like to introduce Christopher Roach, uh, currently at LinkedIn, originally from West Virginia, but in the Bay Area for a very long time. We consider him a native. Uh, and he's going to walk you through a whole set of tutorials that are great. Afterwards, we're going to give you guys um, about a 10 minute break. Mm -hmm. If at that point anybody wants to switch over to the other tract and vice versa, we're going to try and set up another set of people who can help bring you back and forth. I'm Cindy. If you have any questions, you can yell at me. Um, otherwise, I don't want to take any more time from Christopher, Christopher Roach. Everybody? Yay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so, so this is going to be a lot of fun. This is my second time actually giving a talk at Pi Data, so I'm still pretty new to this. And uh, let me see if I can log get logged into my computer. This is my first time, though, ever giving a tutorial, so this will be fun. Um, let me get the, uh, the presentation up and everything so we can get started. Seems to have lost my thing. Hold on. Oh, jeez. Uh, just a second, man. Like, uh, yeah. Whenever I restarted, it seems to have lost it. I may have to wait. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was just looking at. Didn't seem to be in there. <clears throat> All righty. Uh, let's see. Hopefully this is on here. Ah, deleted. Well, that's about the most exciting thing that could happen in a talk right there. Uh, so you all are going to get one heck of a treat because my slides just seem to have gone away whenever I rebooted. So I'm going to have to try and remember everything from scratch. So fantastic. <laughs> OK, thank you. All right, so I guess uh, first off, uh, so everybody knows that you know downloaded the Cloud Era VM and everything, and the whole idea here is that hopefully we can do a little bit of coding along the way. So I'm hoping everybody plays around with this. Um, the basic idea behind this talk is that uh, about a, about two years ago or so, I uh, started working at a small Y Combinator startup, and um, we basically were looking at actually processing our huge amount of logs that we were pulling in, and we needed a way to do it. So we looked to Hadoop, of course. And we were a Python shop, so we wanted to find a way to actually process those logs using Python. And uh, I proceeded to go online and try to find out everything I possibly could. And the idea was that you know I would love to have had just like an hour quick long talk that you know went through and taught me everything I needed to know about writing my first job and you know getting it up and running on Hadoop, uh, getting it up and running on hopefully Amazon uh, Elastic MapReduce, uh, which I'm hoping everybody maybe signed up for that the free version or whatever. Um, so maybe some of the libraries that were out there and everything. So hopefully this is that talk for you. Uh, it will actually get you from knowing hopefully almost nothing whatsoever about MapReduce to uh, actually being able to write your own jobs, kind of understanding the paradigm a little bit, and being able to push it out uh, onto something in the cloud. So hopefully that sounds good to everybody. <laughs> um, I wish I had more visual aids now. This is going to be nice and fun. So I guess a quick little um, background about myself. Uh, I did have a few slides up here uh, for that or whatever. It's like I, I've you know, been... In the Bay Area for about seven years, like she said, I've been working on. I've been working in CS for like 15 years now. It's like I've done everything from embedded systems in like missile defense all the way up to working on you know, the iPhone and you know back to web development and everything. So that's pretty much my background. Um, at LinkedIn now, we do use Hadoop a lot. Um, 
we use Python a lot with, with Hadoop. Um, we tend to use Scala a lot with Hadoop and everything too, but internally we try to use Python as much as we can for everything, so it's a really nice tool to have. Um, so first off, how many people have actually written a, a MapReduce program before? All right, good. I was hoping not a lot. <laughs> it's like, this is a beginner's class, so I want to really kind of like dig into the fundamentals and walk you through all this. So that's good. I was hoping there wasn't too many that, uh, people that went through this. So um, let's see. I'm trying to, it's like, bear with me. I'm trying to remember all this. Um, so the first thing is, you know, is like, why would you actually need, you know, MapReduce? Um, I mean, obviously, the big thing is, you know, it's like whenever you come across a certain amount of data that is just too big for your computer or whatever, right? I mean, you hear the term big data all the time. I tend to use a couple of different definitions of big data. Uh, one being, you know, kind of like uh, the idea of basically if you have data, let's turn it into something that you can actually make actionable decisions on or whatever, right? So that's, I think, what the industry tends to use is big data most of all. Um, the more traditional definition and what I consider to be the much more literal definition is basically data that won't fit on your computer. Um, what do you do with that? Uh, typically, you would basically pull up your data, you'd load it into R or load it into you know, Python, matplotlib, you'd take a look at everything and you would figure out what's going on, but once you get to a certain size, that's not really a possibility anymore. That's where MapReduce comes in. So what is the benefit of MapReduce? I mean, first off, you know, where does it you know, where does it actually come from, right? I mean, so if I remember correctly, it's uh, Jeffrey Dean and Sanjay Gimawat back in 2004 at Google. They wrote their seminal paper. Um, I remember the first part before the actual colon. It's called MapReduce. <laughs> um, and it kind of introduced the world to the idea of using this paradigm to process large amounts of data. It's not a new idea. I mean, if anybody's familiar with functional programming and John McCarthy, uh, Lisp back in the 50s, uh, introduced the world to map and reduce. If you play in Python and you like more of the functional side, you've obviously come across the two functions map and reduce. Um, there's not really you know, a lot to it when you think about it. Map is just basically a function that takes a value and returns a transform on that value. It'll somehow turn into something else. Uh, it could be as simple as an identity transformation. So you could actually return the value itself. Or uh, one, of the, one example is you get a line of data. You get a, a string of text. And you basically output all the words in that text or whatever. So it doesn't have to be necessarily a one-to-one -one transformation, obviously. Um, reduce, on the other hand, basically is just you know, applying the, the addition to all the different lists, uh, all the different elements that are being pulled in. So, um, well, addition would be one example of it. So basically you're taking a large amount, a large set of values and you're reducing them, combining them into uh, a smaller set or a single number or something along those lines. So does that make sense so far <laughs> without actually any slides or anything? So, um, so now what, what does that actually give us? I mean, now that you have this idea of map and reduce, I mean, it comes from, like I said, functional programming. And what's the big benefit of functional programming? Um, if you're into pure functional programming, basically you don't have shared state. You don't have any, uh, you don't have any side effects whenever you call your functions. What that allows you to do now is actually parallelize all of your, all of your actual computation. So let me see if I can actually get a little something up here. Um, let's see. I can make the font a tad bit bigger. So, very simple version would be <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, this is your typical map function, whatever. So, uh, we'll say it's basically going to go through and square something. So, now you're going to take in. Oh, sorry. Yep, yep. There, and on. So, simple function. We go through, we uh, take a list of items, we basically apply a uh, um, you know, square to it. Uh, sorry, that's multiple. Yeah. Um, let me actually do this. I'm sorry, I, I actually like it better whenever I'm doing that. So, we square each value in there and we emit it back or whatever, right? So, the beauty of that, we have 10 values here. What if we had like 10 million or whatever, right? The nice thing is that since 
you know, there's no shared state here. We're not actually, we're not actually changing anything. We're not, we're not performing any side effects. We're not printing out anything. We're not saving to the file system. We're basically just taking a value and emitting it back out. The beauty of that is that now we can start to divide this up into multiple actual processes. So I could actually pull up multiprocessing in Python. I could divide my list of 10 million items into 10 different lists of a million a piece or whatever, and I could run them on 10 different processes. And that's the beauty of map. I mean, map and reduce, it gives you that. It gives you that ability to basically automatically parallelize all of your, all of your uh, computation, right? So <laughs> given that idea, um, what I want you to do, I guess we're going to go ahead and jump into a little bit of coding here because uh, I don't have the rest of my slides to run through. So does everybody have their laptops out? Does everybody have everything they need installed? Um, first thing I'm going to want, uh, the first thing I want you to do is there is one thing that you're going to need to download. We basically need a corpus to work off of. So, we're going to borrow uh, a, bit of a bit of text from Project Gutenberg. I don't seem to be online right now. Oh, um, how do I get on the Wi Fi? This one? M0V. And I probably mistyped it. Yep. Quick show. Yeah. And I lost everything. My, it's like I don't have an account. <laughs> All right. There we go. So uh, do a quick search for Project Gutenberg and 2852. That way we're working off the same thing. This is basically the Hound of the Baskervilles. So the full text for that. And you're going to want to copy that down. So go to this plain text UTF-8. Are you human? All right. Maybe I've visited this too many times now. Obviously, I'm not human. <laughs> wow, so can anybody think of any more things that could possibly go wrong <laughs> on a demo? I was like, I am like literally out of things that could I, I could think of unless like a meteor falls out of the sky on top of me or something. So. <laughs> oh, I didn't even see the one on the right. <laughs> Four, three, eight, three, four, six, six, three, three, six. <laughs> uh, what was that? So, can everybody else get this downloaded? <laughs> oh, we did? Oh, God. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, you know what? It's nice to have a large amount of text, but it's not like you necessarily need to. I'm just, we are in demo purposes at this point in time. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, please tell me everything else is there. So, feel free to use the error text for your uh, example. <laughs> Oh, you know, actually, I, I, I do have the text here. Thank God, something actually stayed on my computer. All right, so basically, um, this is going to be the most, uh, like, I mean, this is the canonical example of how to do a map reduce or whatever, right? Uh, if you've ever done, I mean, if you programmed, obviously, you've seen the Hello World. This is the Hello World for map reduce. We're going to use it for pretty much everything. I'm hoping a few of you haven't seen it yet, because the first time I saw it, I actually thought it was very clever. Um, so hopefully a few of you will be a little bit surprised and think, oh, that's really neat how you can do that. But then hopefully <clears throat> what we'll do, excuse me, is we'll take this all the way through um, each of the steps that we want to do. Hopefully we're going to get this running and just see how to do MapReduce, and then we're going to actually see it on Hadoop, 
if everybody's got you know, the VM installed. And then we'll actually see it in a fantastic library called Mr. Job that's developed by Yelp. And then we'll finally push it out, hopefully, to uh, Amazon ZMR. So that's the goals for today. Hopefully, everything else goes correctly. <laughs> so how do you do this? How do you do a normal kind of word count here? Um, I think, for the most part, start off with a uh, import sys and we'll just walk through the actual standard in. We're going to assume that we're going to pass this in through standard input, um, divide each line into a set of words, probably create a dict, right? And actually use that dict to count all the unique words. Seems easy enough. Everybody want to give it a try? You want to actually see what I have up here? We can just skip past that. and. Uh, I believe this is the right one. Yep. Can everybody actually see that, or do I need to adjust the font? Command plus. Thank you. Is that good? All right. So yeah, pretty much exactly what we said. Simple. Loop through the line, loop through the standard in. Build a dict and uh, print out all the words after you've counted them all. So what's the problem with this? Anybody? See any issue with this if you have a large amount of data? What is it? Sorting. Sorting? Storing, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, you're, you're basically storing every last bit of this in memory. So you're going to reach a point where you're going to take over, you know, your, the, your main memory that you have. And then after that, every time you go through and try to access one of those words, I mean, worst case scenario, it's actually going to push that out onto your hard disk, right? And you're going to be thrashing back and forth. I mean, that's worst case if you have something that's too big for your main memory, right? What if you have something that's too big for, you know, it's like, that's best case there. It's like, if you have something that's too big for your computer altogether, your hard disk and everything, then you're really out of luck. This just basically won't do anything for you whatsoever. So how do you actually turn this into something that you can run on multiple machines? How do you make it parallel? So this is where it gets slightly more interesting. And of course, this is where you start to use map and reduce. So you have to be a little bit, you have to kind of think outside the box a little bit, I guess, is what I would say. So I want you to go ahead and try these out. I want to I wanna basically uh, have everybody doing this interactively, right? So this is, your, this is basically your map function. <clears throat> So go ahead and start copying this down. It's only a few lines, so it shouldn't take anybody any time. Um, very simple. Again, we're just basically looping through the standard input. We're splitting all the words. And this time, we're actually doing something slightly different. We're printing out basically the word and the number one. So now this is an example of pretty much like a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping that I was talking about earlier. So very simple. Imagine this is split over to multiple computers now. Um, easily runs. You don't have to worry about any of these things actually conflicting with one another. My map function doesn't rely on another map function actually going through and setting anything. I mean, yes, technically we are writing this out to uh, the command line or writing it out to a file. but. The other map function doesn't depend on the output for this. That's the big deal. I mean, that's the one that allows you to kind of spread this out over everything. So has everybody got that copied down? So you can go ahead and give it a try with, you know, it's like your text. Hopefully you were able to download that. We're actually going to run this thing through, you know, it's like, at the end of the day, it's like MapReduce, uh, you know, it's like there's a couple of things here. I mean, right, MapReduce is, is, is a concept. You don't actually need any special tools to run this to actually see it work. You can actually do it from the command line. That's what we're going to do first. Um, once you get into the actual spe special tools, you notice that it's you know a little bit more than that. There's a little bit more bit up around it. There's an act there's a special um, uh, a special like distributed file system and everything that you'll use, and we'll hopefully see that a little bit later. But first, let's take a look at our reducer. So now it starts to get a little more interesting. So what you're going to do again is you're going to loop through standard input. Everything happens in standard input. So 
Hadoop is what we're going to end up using. That's pretty much the most well-known MapReduce system. Um, there's others out there. Uh, basically, it's written in sorry, it's written in Java, and whenever you write your MapReduce, you actually write it in Java. Uh, one of the things that was created later on for it was this idea of a streaming library, and it'll basically allow you to use any language that you want to interact with uh, Hadoop and actually write your MapReduce jobs. And the way it does that is by relying completely on standard in and standard out. So as long as you write your functions around this, you'll be able to run it against uh, run it with Hadoop and spread it across as many machines as you want. And the nice thing about this is that it allows you to kind of write your jobs and test it from the command line and actually do your debugging super simple like that. Because once you actually get it into Hadoop, it'll be almost impossible to debug anything. <laughs> so again, you're going to run through um, each line. You're going to split them out. Uh, you basically get a key value pair here. So the key being the word, the, um, the value being the number one that we wrote out earlier. And we're going through and we're actually adding each one of these up. So the, way, the reason this works, this is basically going to take the output from your map job that you just got done writing. But now, if you remember, your map job basically just loops through all of the data in the pg258.txt file or whatever. So those aren't necessarily in any specific order, other than what the author intended them to be in. <laughs> um, but here, you're actually going through. And if you notice, we're checking here if key does not equal previous key. So we're assuming that everything is coming in in sort of a sorted order. And that's a little bit of the, the behind the scenes magic from Hadoop that you get or whatever, right? It'll basically, it has a step that you call the shuffle sort step, which will take all of your information from your map uh, function. And it'll go through and it'll sort all of your keys and pass them into your reducers. So your reducers can always count on the fact that they're going to get a key and they're going to get a list of all the values for that same key. That's why you can actually write it up like this. And we'll see this work in a little bit once everybody's got it typed up. And Let me see if I can actually, I want to, I did have at least a, a couple of good images on here that I remember where they are, so. Come on, please be nice to me. <laughs> I've obviously harmed somebody in a, a previous life. All right, so this is like, you'll see this picture everywhere, and actually this is a fantastic you know, representation of it. Um, this is the shuffle sort step right here that I was talking about. So you'll notice each, you can, you can assume that basically each of these colors represents like a specific key in your data. So each of your mappers are all the way over here on the left you'll have a certain number of reducers. Um, you notice that the number of, like, these are going to be files on your, hard, on your hard drive, basically. Notice that, that they map up perfectly to the number of reducers that you have. Basically, what happens is your mappers run on each machine. They know how, exactly how many reducers you have. They basically save a file for each one of those reducers with all the output from your mapper. And what they'll do is they'll basically go through, typically you can, you can change this behavior, but normally what happens is it'll take the key, it'll run a hash, and it'll take that hashed value, and it'll do a modulo on the number of reducers that you have. And that way you get two things out of that, two nice benefits. One is that you get a, a fairly even distribution of all the keys across your reducers, so no one's overloaded or whatever, so you actually spread out the, uh, the computation. And the other thing is you get this nice, like, you know, sorting step or whatever, right? I mean, like everything, notice all the keys are in one place. So whenever, what happens is once your mapper's done, it'll go through, it'll save all that information into the different files. It'll notify the main node, the master node that keeps track of everything that's going on in the system. And it'll say, look, here's where you can find the actual files for each reducer. The reducers will then be notified of that and they'll go back to each mapper and pull each of those files off. And that's how they get all their data. Um, and then what happens whenever your reducer runs, they'll get that key. So, you know, in this case, they'll get that turquoise key or whatever, and they'll get all the values that you associated with that key, and they'll get them in an iterator. So you don't have to worry about overloading your memory that way either. You can just basically loop through each value as you go. So, everybody had this typed up? Sorry, what was that? Uh, you mean both of these? Yeah, yeah, sure. 
man, are you kidding me? You can have every, anything you want with all the stuff that's going wrong. You all are being nice to me. <laughs> anything you, can, you ask for. I'm stupid. <laughs> All right. Is that everything you're looking for? All right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and run this down on the bottom. And I want you all to go ahead and run it with me. I'll leave this up so you can actually see it. <laughs> All right, so to test this out, I mean, this is basically all that's going to happen whenever you run it on Hadoop. You basically want to output the text from your file, so cat that, run it through your mapper. It's like Unix comes with this nice sort command, so you want to pipe it through there so you get the shuffle sort situation. And then finally, you'll run it through your reducer. Everybody got that? So hopefully, if everything was typed in correctly when you hit enter, you'll actually see all the, the word counts for everything. <laughs> so, I'm still see a few people typing. So anyway, so there we go. Uh, simple map reduce. That's the whole thing. That's basically the concept right there. So I, I, I mean, I still need a. First time I saw it, I thought it was so cool. <laughs> um, I, I, like, I started actually, and this is all my interview questions whenever we brought new people in and everything. So if they'd never come across MapReduce before, tried to keep on pushing situations like this in their face and see if they could figure it out on their own. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah. Actually, let me make this one a little bit bigger too. There you go. Can you see that? Yep. So now, if you're doing pure Hadoop streaming, this is how you'll write all your code. You'll actually do it just with the standard in and everything. And this is the best way that you can possibly test it right here. Um, that's the nice thing about you know, the fact that it's not doing anything different than what you know, Unix does normally. So you can put in all your, your debug breakpoints here and figure out what's going on. Um, fantastic you know, that you can actually do this. Once you get into Hadoop, it gets a little bit harder. You can actually run it on your local machine and, start, and still debug a little bit, but it's not, not the best environment to be in. So that's like why I really, really love this. So. Has everybody at least tried that once? How many people actually have uh, you know, the Cloudera VM on their machines? Fantastic. Uh, let's hope that I still do. Um, <laughs> go ahead and pull that up. Uh, what I want to try and do is actually run this in Hadoop. Um, so we'll get a little bit of experience with Hadoop now. Where can you download it? Uh, yeah, if you just look for, um, if you look for CDH4. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's quite large actually. Um, so, I mean, if you want to, if you want to try this out later, you, you go grab the CDH4. CDH5 is latest, but it takes like eight gigs of RAM to run it, so that's why I'm, I'm running this one. <laughs> um, you can just follow along for the time being. I mean, if you have Hadoop uh, already installed on your system, you could use that too, but it's kind of a pain, so that's why this is the easiest way to go. So let me go ahead and get this started up. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank God it's still there. All right, so 
I created a virtual ENV earlier, mainly just because I'm going to have you all install Mr. Job a little bit later if you haven't already installed it um, or have it on your machine. It may actually come with the Anaconda um, download. I don't, I don't, I'm not totally sure. <laughs> Um, first things first, to get that on your machine, you're going to want to go into, uh, let's see, devices, work, drag and drop. If you go up to devices and drag and drop, you want to do bi-directional. Does everybody see that? Just set that up so you can actually drag your files across. It's the easiest way to do it. And I believe I've already got mine all here. Yay, okay. So, and this is the fun part. It's like actually remembering all the, the things that you have to put in to get Hadoop running pro you know, properly is like such a pain. Um, so, Remember, I said the actual streaming capability is, is a separate library altogether. So Hadoop actually comes with a command called jar, where you can specify any, any library jar or whatever on the command line. That's what we're going to do here. We're going to pull in the actual streaming jar. So I need to f we can find that first. Actually, I think I have it copied down. Yay, here we go. All right, this is going to be a little bit harder to read. Let me see if I can get this a bit bigger. Can everybody see that? So this will all be installed on your machines if you have Cloudera running. So Hadoop jar. Um, there's several actually streaming jar files on here. I don't know exactly what they're all there for. This one definitely works. So that's the one you want to go with. So user lib. Uh, Hadoop 0 20 or dot 20. So, streaming Hadoop jar. Don't hit anything yet, just type all that in. We basically have to tell it uh, where our files are and everything. Oh, that reminds me, I did forget one thing. Open up a new tab. If you know how to open up a tab on this. So, if you type in HDFS, so this is the distributed file system that we talked about earlier. So you're going to be playing around with this a little bit. So I don't know why you actually have to specify both of these. Um, actually, I take it back. I do know why. There's a local file system too, but it just seems kind of weird to me that you have to constantly say HDFS and then DFS. Uh, then you have all kinds of commands like you normally have on the Unix command line, like dash ls and everything. So if you type that in and hit enter, you probably won't see a lot. I have some things on here. Um, but you can type it in with uh, just a slash. And I believe, let's see, user, there should be a Cloudera user in here. Yeah, basically you're logged in as Cloudera right now. So that's where everything's located. So what we're going to want to, I mean, what we're going to do here, whoops. We basically have to have our input file, the PG2582, uh, whatever TXT file, in Hadoop's distributed file system in order to run the MapReduce job on it. So we're going to go ahead and copy that in now. So does everybody have all the, the files copied over to Cladera, or to their virtual machine? Anybody still? Uh, the, yeah, the MapReduce code? You mean this? Yeah. So is, how many people have actually ran a MapReduce job on Hadoop? Okay. Yeah. Not a lot. Thank God. <laughs> Fantastic. So, all right. Are you ready for, are you ready to run it or? Doesn't have Hadoop jar. Oh, uh, the Hadoop dash zero two. 
user lib. Do you not have a? Do you have Hadoop on there? What happens if you just type Hadoop uh, version or something like that? Okay, it's on there at least. Um, doesn't take long to actually run through this. Do a find slash, you know, it's like, and then look for Hadoop star streaming star dot jar. Um, you may. On the distributed file system? That's what we're going to do right now. So, yes, we will definitely do that right now. Because if, if nothing else, you can't actually run it without it being on there. So. <laughs> All right, so is everybody else ready to go ahead and put their file on here? All right, so like I said, you have a bunch of different commands. I, I think there actually is a dash CP that you can use, so it's a little bit closer to uh, Unix, but I know for sure you have a copy from local. So it's actually really simple to get your files up there. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this one up. You can actually uh, specify a different, well, actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and do that. We'll play around with this a little bit. So do a make dir. And what this will do is put whatever you want in your home directory so you don't have to specify the full path. We'll go ahead and create our own word count folder. I may already have one on there, so we'll find out. And now if you do... HDFS, DFS, dash LS again, you should see that your work count folder shows up. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. I don't. Really? Uh, that one's not doing it on here for me. So, uh, probably not that one, right? There you go, is that better? All right, so everybody got their word count folder set up. You wanna go ahead and copy the uh, file in. Oops, so copy from local. And grab the PG file that you downloaded or the error file or whatever you got. And load that into word count. If you want to give it the full path, it'll be user uh, slash user slash Cloudera slash word count. And now you can just be sure that that's on there. Oops, misspelled. All right, everybody got that on there? Ready to actually run your MapReduce? So. <laughs> if you have it on there, go back to the last tab where we uh, brought up the Hadoop jar. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to break this up so you can actually see it all. So now you have to specify your input file. Both this, see, this actually gets a little bit verbose. I don't actually understand why you have to do all this, but you're going to do each file. So dash file, specify the one you want. Uh, so we'll start off with our our uh, input, which I forgot what the thing was. So PG in my case it's one three four two dot txt, And then we need to specify that that is input, and we're actually going to say do that again. I'll do this a little bit verbose. You basically do this for everything. So you'll do file. You're going to want to do this for your mapper and your reducer. So you should have something that looks about like this whenever you're done. Let me go ahead and type it in, though. Uh, you don't have to copy your, your mapper and reducer in there, just your input. So, uh, basically, whenever first, I'm, I'm, you know, it'll whenever you tell it your mapper and reducer, it'll actually automatically upload that to uh, DFS for you. So you don't have to worry about that part. Yeah. 
and then you want to specify your output. So, and now what's going to happen is whenever you get done with it, whenever uh, MapReduce gets finished, it's going to shove this onto Hadoop's distributed file system. So you're going to want to specify something there. So you want it to be in our word count folder. So go ahead and specify word count slash output. All right, I'm going to go ahead and run this because it does take a little bit of time, but I'm going to bring up my other notes so you can actually watch, uh, look at it if you're. Oh, great. G132. Oh, come on. Let's see if I sold you wrong. Man, I know it's there. What am I putting in wrong here? It's my favorite part of this whole thing, figuring out over and over again which one is. All right, let's see. that over. Sorry. You're getting the same thing I'm getting, where it's saying that the file isn't there, or what? That one is a new one for me. Let me see. Exist. Oh, this is one of the things that I liked about the Cladera thing is that it sets way, up all the config this is, for you. Op Cladera parcels. Jeez. Yeah, I had to go searching around for the other one too. So, um... Yeah, this is the thing that, I mean, like, this is usually set up in your config. So was I meant to copy something, actually? Is there a config file for me to copy? I didn't. No, I mean, that's the that's the point of my trying to get everybody to use the Cloudera. It actually sets oh, up all the config for you and everything, so I don't know why that's not yeah, set up. Yeah, I just downloaded on. the VM, and that's it. That's the biggest, uh, this is 5, five right? Yeah. yeah, I hadn't played around with the 5. Maybe they did something a little differently on that one. Like break it? Or <laughs> I guess it's possible. <laughs> Plus, uh, there's also... Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, I know that one actually is there. It's like I just uh, find it easier to use the file a lot of times. So. Um, all right. All right, sorry. Let's see if we can. So Hadoop streaming is located on a different spot if you're actually on CDH5 than it is here. Um, it was in slash opt. Uh, Yeah, I was going to say, if you run the find command on slash op slash cloudera slash parcels and then look for Hadoop star streaming star dot jar, that'll probably find it for you. All right, and now I got to figure out why it doesn't actually recognize my, my file. Mm -hmm. All right, let me. Jeez. So, two eight five two. Let's see. Oh man, I really have to apologize for this. I'm terribly sorry. It's like I lost everything coming in. All right, yay, that finally ran. <laughs> so once you stop typing in the actual wrong number, everything seems to work eventually. So anyway, that'll take a while to run. Um, I want to make sure that everybody else gets this actually running too. So, who's actually having problems? <laughs> yeah. Error in a. Error in a. Well, that's a nice error. So what, what is your what, what was your output file uh, folder? Did uh, you just word do count. word count? Yeah. And just word count or or word count slash output? output. Okay. Um, do a do HDFS DFS um, dash ls on word count and see if the output folder is there. Another thing is, have you ran it more than once? It gets really. So you have an output folder there. Um, do HDFS DFS <laughs> dash L or dash cat. Yeah. Yeah. Space uh, word count slash output slash heart dash star. <laughs> yeah. Hit that. Come on. File directory. Uh, do an ls in the output. Let's see what's in there. Basically, whenever you run this, so whenever you whenever you run this and it's successful, I'll go ahead and talk through this. You should have uh, just a second. You should have a uh, if you did it in word count, you should have an output folder inside of there. You should have something that says success, hopefully uh, something along those lines, and then you'll have um, a part file. It'll say part dash I think zero 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 zero. Um, Basically, the number of reducers is the one that tells you exactly how many of these parts files you have. Hopefully, that's in there. And if it is, you can run HDFS, DFS, dash cat, uh, give it word count slash output slash part dash star. <laughs> I'll type it up there in just a second. Um, I got logs, and that's it. You have logs. Yeah. See, this is the fun part about <laughs> debugging now. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, 
Hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah, very verbose. Uh, yeah, no. there. Yeah, take a look at your log. Uh, you can do a cat on that that exact same thing, like the one I just showed you. Maybe that'll give you a little bit of idea. Cool. Maybe there's actually a bug in the um, the code or something like that. So this is That's the fun, fun part of. <laughs> so who else? All right, go one at a time. All right, let me just run this one command for you real quick. So if you did get it successful, you can actually run this. Uh, let me clear that. Output. All right, so if everything executed properly, this is what you should have, something that looks like this. Um, one of the things that uh, the Hadoop system does, it's going to assume that you're running this with tons of mappers, tons of reducers, and you're going to have all these different files. And it's really good about just kind of putting all these together for you. So I don't have one right now, but if you wanted to, you could do what I was saying. You could say the, the dash cat uh, word count slash output and then part. Uh, something along those lines, and it should go through and cat every single thing in all of your part files. It'll actually pull all of them together and spit it all out for you. So, oh, you probably need to see that actually. You should have something hopefully that looks like that whenever you run that command. So if everybody's went through successful, go ahead and run that. In the meantime, I'm gonna help out a few people, hopefully. <laughs> so you had an issue and you had an issue, excuse me. I kind of expected desks here. <laughs> We're actually getting uh, pretty close to everybody having it done. And um, actually getting pretty close to the end. That's actually, dealing with Hadoop is kind of a pain. So I want to get you at least to the very last part before we uh, call it a day. So I'm going to kind of move ahead. And I can totally hang out afterwards and answer any questions for anybody if you want to continue to try and get this thing fixed. But I think for the most part, just about everybody's got something up and running now. So um, probably won't have enough time to actually run this in EMR, but I'm going to at least introduce you to Mr. Job. Has anybody actually used Mr. Job before or heard of Mr. Job? Uh, it's a really, really nice library. So what you've seen so far is you're actually using standard in to actually read this stuff in, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's better than writing Java, obviously. But I mean, it's not the best thing in the world. Um, what Mr. Job gives you is a couple of really nice things. I mean, first off, it's going to take care of all of your uh, serialization for you, right? So, so now you no longer have to just emit, say, like a keyword and a number. You can actually emit uh, a Python dict or, you know, tuple, whatever you want, and it'll read that back in. And now you have, like, much, much richer data that you can actually do all of your uh, computation on. So that's one of the absolute biggest benefits. It's also something to keep in mind whenever you're working with Mr. Job, you're gonna deal with the overhead of all the serialization. So if you do tend to run into things that are starting to slow down whenever you're using this, it might not be a bad idea to um, skip the serialization and actually go for pure text and stuff like that like we have been doing. Mm. The other thing is, is it makes it like super easy to actually push all of your work out to EMR. It's basically written around that. All of I believe Yelp pretty much does all of their stuff on, on Amazon's, um, you know, in the cloud services and everything. So they, uh, it, it's just so, so simple to actually push it out. So let's go ahead and take a look at the same thing, the MapReduce using Mr. Job.